Now let's uh, let's start by talking about starting out in Fairfield, Connecticut. You know, when you were a kid playing back there, and yeah. when did you pick up the guitar? When was the first time you knew you wanted to do music? Well, I picked up the guitar from time to time at friends' houses and stuff. Probably, I don't even remember how early on, and I was always intrigued by it. Um, wasn't sure how I was going to make my way into it, but I always knew that it was interested in me. Like uh, I was always the guy to pick up the guitar and. Kind of, the first thing I ever did was tune it up into a chord. You know, I kind of always understood the mechanics of it, but it wasn't until I was, I think I was 13, my dad rented my brother, one of my brothers and I, uh, an acoustic guitar from the music store. We were gonna take, we were gonna take guitar lessons. And before I even went to my first lesson, I kind of found my own path with it. So yeah. I, and it really does feel like the same, same day. I mean, I'm 28 now, 15, yeah. I've been playing guitar for 15 years, yeah. and it feels like the same day. I'm on the same time, the timeline is never broken. You know? Right, and, you, and your guitar playing, by the way, I mean, people are finding out that people have seen you live, but I mean, with the trio recently mm -hmm. playing, I mean, your guitar playing has been amazing. I love the stuff you've been doing. Thank you, life. thank you. It's, it's a whole different mindset for me because, truth be told, in the pop world, it's very easy for me to play guitar. I mean, I right. could eat an apple while I'm playing guitar yeah. on pop music. Yeah. And um, it doesn't really interest me anymore to be able, I, I, I want to bring my ability, or I want to bring my playing all the way up to the top of ability. And then from there on, kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Seesaw, you know, there's some nights where my playing is right up to my ability. And then there are some nights my playing is, you know, my, my, my playing goes over my ability, which yeah. means that I kind of hit that place where I'm unsure, but then I always find that I get a little further into the mindset, into the craft by doing that. So it's really just a matter of taking the handicap away. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. And getting into a situation where um, there's some nights I get off stage, I feel terrible about being a guitar player, but it's so much better than being on stage and thinking about what what kind of food is waiting on the bus when you're off yeah. off off the stage. I never cop out in this trio. Yeah. I've never once copped out. Copping out is playing to be done. Yeah. And it happens. Musicians will tell you it happens all the time, you know. Oh yeah, I'm up there playing for 60 billion people, you know, at the Thunderdome. And uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, what I'm gonna have for dinner, where, I'm gonna, where we're gonna be tomorrow. Yeah. I can't do that in this yeah. band, you know. So I like the challenge. And I also like the gamble of putting it all out there the nights it doesn't work, it feels like you lost. It feels like you lost big at blackjack, but the nights that somehow you break through the wall of what you, of the end of your, the end of your ability, and you realize that there's more ability past the wall, it's there's nothing better than it. When did you decide you were going to do the trio? I mean, it's and then tell us how you got hooked up with Steve and Pino. How did you decide on them as the musicians that you wanted to work with in this trio? Um, I had messed around with the trio concept a little bit. We had done some after show performances with the band I was in, you know, the solo act, man, yeah. uh, last summer, summer David 2004. Guys, yeah. 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 And I loved the format. I loved the idea. But it wasn't until Steve, Pino, and I got in a room, which was a kind of a staggered situation because I'd met Steve probably a year or two before I ever met Pino. And Steve and I had played together, started to do some sessions around New York City. Were you fans of the things he'd worked with before? Did I didn't really know a lot of them. Yeah, right. But I, I knew from playing with him that this is a guy, it was like a blind taste test because yeah. I didn't know going in uh, every detail of his dis discography. But when I started playing with him, I realized that every session I ever did with Steve Jordan, again, never copped out. These are yeah. guys who will not, will not settle for anything less than complete commitment to what's going on. And yeah. I loved, I felt like I was with the big boys. And yeah. know, like, I w came home from a session with Steve one time, the first one we actually really played in a room together and was just like, I feel like I just had grade A sushi or grade A, you know, yeah. hotel or grade, it's just so, yeah. it's so luxurious in terms of the quality level that these guys are playing at, that I knew that I wanted that. And every time I went home from playing with them, I felt better about my playing and I felt like more committed to music yeah. through them. But um, it wasn't until we all three got in a room together, it was instant. Yeah. And it instantly broke my heart. I can't explain it. As yeah. soon as I heard it and felt it, it's, it's what people talk about and other people doubt. Yeah, that's you know? right. Well, you could see that on stage. When I saw the show uh, down in Orlando, I was, uh, I was knocked out. And you did 
a cover of a Hendrix Wait Until Tomorrow, which was phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, Thanks, man. Your playing was great on it. I mean, I, I really felt like I was listening to Axis, Bold Thank as you, Love, man. which That's is so such funny. a great album. Axis, Bold as Love, I think we might have talked about this, yeah. is the greatest Hendrix record ever. Yeah, it's also too. the most overlooked Hendrix record. Yeah. Um, my love of Jimi Hendrix's music goes deeper than uh, lighting a guitar on fire, feedback, loud, whammy bar. Right. Jimi Hendrix was a phenomenal rhythm player. In fact, yeah. in some ways, a more developed rhythm player than a soloist, which yeah. you know might sound like blasphemy, but I'm actually getting more religious on it, not yeah. less religious on it. Yeah. And you know, Hendrix came from this kind of Isley Brothers, Curtis Mayfield, yeah. Chitlin Circuit Jimmy kind Jimmy of training. Jimmy Jimmy yeah. Guys. yeah, yeah. These, th so it was a lot of this. Uh, really intricate rhythm guitar playing stuff. And you yeah. hear it in R&B, actually, all the time. These chords. Yeah. And it's really just this kind of Isley Brothers thing, you know? Yeah. And um, his ability to kind of interpret that and while he's singing is, to me, his greatest, his, his, his greatest talent. Uh, obviously, as a soloist, that's over the top. But I'm really attracted to the rhythm guitar sense and what's going inside. Like if you listen to Like a Rolling Stone from Monterey Pop Festival, yeah. he's playing, once upon a time he dressed so fine in the drama, na 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 You know, and as he's doing that, if you listen to the guitar part, it is, I've never heard anything like it in my life. The rhythm guitar part that's going as he's singing. It's, it's really mesmerizing. And so that's the thing I love about Wait Till Tomorrow, which is that I, I think he played it twice. Yeah. I mean, he played it on, on a, um, in the BBC record. Yeah. And he played it on Axis Bowl is Love, and that's it. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's because he knew that for some reason the band wasn't. Like, that's something an artist does when yeah. he, his band can't play the song right. Right. And it's a short, one of the shortest songs, too. It's like really All his best songs are the shortest. I mean, yeah. Little Wing is. Yeah. Right. Little Wing is just like a breeze. And lyrically on that album, he hit a stride too with Castles Made of Sand. The songs it's like that unreal. Kills you. Unreal. Yeah. And Jimi Hendrix to me is, a, is actually a very sad story. To me, it's a very sad story. It's, it's a man who had such a connection to something that everybody around him wished wish they had as well that they substituted that by basically glomming onto him. Yeah. And it's so funny, man, because in death, the truth evaporates. The truth as to who knew you, who really knew you, like who yeah. you, who, you know, there's a lot of people who do interviews about Jimi Hendrix who I know in my heart cosmically, Jimmy would have said, I don't want that guy talking for me. Yeah. You know what oh, I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know there's some guy, yeah. and Ivan, I'm not gonna name names, but there are certain people, I can just smell it on them. Yeah. You know, and this happens in death. If nobody, if the world didn't find out that the person that died hated you, yeah. Then you're not, and then you're going to ignore it and yeah. keep rolling on. You know there are people who you talk to, who are authorities on these people who used to be alive, and you know it. One night, this the, the person who used to be alive said, "You know what? Go fuck yourself. I'm done." <laughs> yeah, but exactly. it was a private conversation. <laughs> yeah. And then they went and died, and the guy went, well, "No one really knew that he told me that." <laughs> yeah. And then they go out and they talk about the great relationship that for, they had for the rest of their lives. Right. And so in death, a it's a very sad thing that there is no definition of possession of who possessed the most information about who you who was really inside your heart and it, and I feel like writing a will just in an emotional way like Put the here, list of people that here are actually... the people who know what the hell they're talking about when they talk about me yeah. you know and 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 to me within 3 short years the man discovered something genius yeah. um found the apex of it unfortunately the apex is year 2 yeah. you know and by the end of it, you can see it in his face. He's just so ripped apart from everybody, just so taken from. He was. He was really, I think he was really worn down. There was, it was obvious Everybody took interviews. everything. I mean, he's, you know, he writes in Little Wing, you can you know, take anything you want from me, anything. And I think that was probably, you know, the case more often than not. Let's go back in, in time now to your history, John. When you did Room for Squares, what was the recording experience like that? I mean, at the time, obviously, you're doing it on your own. Yeah. To aware. And how many shows had you had behind you? A lot, time? actually. I'd played a bunch of shows, um, really intimate shows at that yeah. point. I mean, I was still 
meeting the same people at the shows night after night. Yeah. You know, because people was, followed you around. I mean, there were busloads of people. Yeah, and I miss those people. To be honest with you, yeah. I know that there are people who used to come to my shows who felt such a connection with me that as soon as it became more successful, they stopped. And I, and I always think about them. I think about them a lot. Like, when's the last time they saw a show, and would they ever go see a show in an arena? And would I ever do that if I were them? And the answer is probably, well, no. You know, I'm not. They can say they knew me when I was talking to them after the shows. So I'd already built a connection with fans, and certainly built a connection with the songs that I'd written. Um, but I mean, there's no comparison to where I am now in terms of my mind frame of how to write songs and, and, and produce them. But there's a real joy that I'm, I try and make sure that I get still. It's harder to find it, but real joy in that first record experience of um, meeting people whose job is to make your record happen. I yeah. mean, nothing, oh, nothing was taken for granted first time around. Like, mm -hmm. these people are gonna make my record. Like, they're gonna do for me. Of course, now I know that it's really a little more, you know, vulturous <laughs> than that. Yeah. But, but at the time, actually everyone, I shouldn't say that because everybody is still great, a great friend of mine, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a sense of discovery in, the, in, in making your first record that I missed. Um, when you came to making heavier things afterwards, uh, heavier things around? is my is well the traditional um, second record, try my best but don't have my feet on the ground record. Right. It's hard to explain. There's a because of all the stuff that had happened during Roof for Square. Yeah, you just get a little fat. You just get a little fat in every way. You just get a little fat. You just somehow lose the direction for a second. Half that record's really great, and half that record would have been um, left on the side if I had had enough time to write some new songs. You know? Was that because of the grueling schedule you were I keeping? I think so, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, I, sure. mean, I think, because, you know, some people love the record, think the record's fantastic. I mean, obviously, you have half the record you're, you feel you could have done differently or better because... No, half know, the record's not... I mean, the thing is, half the record's not fantastic. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> that, I mean, is with the objectivity that I can say, like, this next record is over the top and it won't come out there's a record called Continuum that I'm about 75% done with yeah. that will not come out until I know that it can, it can have every chance possible. Like and you, it's, a th it's really, the, I mean, this is going to be the third studio album. John third Mayer studio album, album so be but I learned a lot from Heavier Things, and I gave myself a year to write a record. Are you going to work with Jack Joseph Puig again, or have you thought um, about other producers? What I feeling? think, well, actually, I'm producing this record with Steve Jordan. Oh, cool. I know it sounds like a scary thing when an artist says, I'm going to produce my own record, but yeah. Steve and I create one whole sphere together, yeah. and there's no, there's a little bit of overlap, but not really. There's not really a lot of overlap. The things that I'm interested in, I'm better at than Steve is, and the things Steve is interested in, I, I can't even get my head around. So we both kind of walk up to the board and do our little thing and back off and make room for the other guy to come up into it, you know. Yeah. So Steve has this attention, I mean unwavering attention to groove. Yeah. I yeah, mean, he, plays, he's he is a groove master. Yeah, he's Not even just in his playing, but in his really getting down into the basement of the tune. Yeah. How, how this kick drum, the note's too long. and. It needs to be shorter, and if it's shorter, then it will translate into my space, which is the attic yeah. of the tune, you know, the guitars, yeah. the vocals. And the way that we get on doing that is actually pretty amazing. Even in a mix situation, we'll both go in the studio on the same day, but just different times. So yeah. Steve will go in there at one in the afternoon, stay till three. I'll run in after Steve, go in at six and tweak, and then maybe Steve will come back at the very end and fix something else. But we don't go into each other's closets. It's really interesting. I've never gone, no, Steve, drums got to be lower. And Steve's never gone, do you really think we should? Uh, and if he does, and if I do, and if the answer is, no, it's cool, then there's immediately like, got it. An unbelievable level of respect there. And I feel really kind of honored in a way to be one of those artists that, when you, when you make the decision to produce a record with somebody, and become that close as individuals with one another, you make the decision to take off your kind of external ego. Yeah. You know? You and have to, I mean, to function in yeah, situation. Yeah, exactly. And so I know Steve, when I'm playing with him, he's obviously a superhuman drummer, yeah. but I know him like a guy, and he knows me like a guy. Right. 
And that is one of the best things about playing music with your brothers, you know? Yeah. Um, the world knows Steve Jordan as the greatest drummer around, yeah. and I know Steve Jordan as, yeah, that, but Steve. Yeah. And he knows me, and I know, I know in some ways his limits, yeah. and he knows my limits, and we both know when to look at each other and go, I don't know. That's all right. All right. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Give me a second. We have yeah. conversations on the phone, and we both defer to each other. It's like he's got no problem saying, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Again, you're absolutely right. And I've got no problem going, say no more. Say no more. It's yeah. all you have to say. Totally got it. Yeah. I got to go. I'll call you. Yeah. You know? So um, what I have back now is the discovery. I have my sense of discovery back completely. And the trio is what allowed me to do that. If you want to lose your sense of discovery, sell millions of records each time out on your first two albums. Yeah. You will lose a sense of discovery like you couldn't imagine because everybody goes, great, here's where we are, here's what we do. Yeah. And, and so, you challenged yourself more. Yeah, I mean, I'm too young to be the anything guy. Right, I, I know. You know, that, yeah. too young to be the anything guy. When it came to winning, you know, the two Grammys, obviously mm -hmm. your body is a wonderland, the first time around, and then daughters. You know, song of the year. That's a that's a big. That was a big thing it's too. Huge. How how was that for you? I mean, because that's I know you're the kind of guy very very introspective and you think through things. Yeah. How was how was your feeling after that when that all went down with the, with the Grammy the second time around? Um. Yeah. Well, it was fantastic. I don't okay. think there's ever an experience where you get a Grammy and there's any bitter <laughs> yeah. in it. Yeah, it's exactly. just there's no bitter. Exactly. It's just sweet. Yeah. I did not want daughters to be a single. Um. So I hold that Grammy kind of half for the people who said, no, this should be heard. It doesn't play into my career very yeah. well at all. Actually, that song does not bode well for my career as I see it. Yeah. But as a, as a song outside of that framework, um, it was a huge success, and I'm really proud of it. I just It's very difficult for me to explain the genuine sentiment in that song yeah. because it really does sound like pandering crap. I mean, it really does. To be At the time, I was 26. And I was singing "Fathers Be Good to Your Daughters." I think it's I think that's crap. I think that's a crap thing <laughs> to have out there. It's yeah. a very sacred song to me. Yeah. And meaning like it stays an album track. It's not one of the. When it stays out. an album track, nobody can say that you're trying to manipulate anybody, no. you know. And when people said it's time to make daughters a single, I said, "Don't you dare! Don't you dare!" Because I knew that it was going to be. Just like death. And taken out of context by some people. Yeah. They weren't going to understand it. Well, when you take your body as a wonderland and daughters, it's, I mean, you kind of almost triangulating my position in the world. Yeah. And you go, well, let's see. The three, you know, he's got your body as a wonderland and daughters. What is he trying to, what is he trying to do? <laughs> it is the pansification of John Mayer is really what it was. Right. And the, the, the concept of that now being my thing. Right frightened the hell out of me because there are a lot of bands who put out ballads right. like, like Nickelback for right. example yeah. are confined although this new photograph tune is unbelievably good yeah it is. I mean unbelievably good he's a great songwriter no matter what gotta give it up to the guy yeah if I ever see a guy uh, Chad right yeah, Chad Grover, it was yeah. super cool to me he's a nice dude he's really super great. cool yeah like if, if when I see him again I'm just gonna like have to sit down and be like that's so cool and what he does should be highly respected by every musician. Yeah. Every musician in the world should look to him as an inspiration because the guy is probably aware of the kind of voice of dissent in terms of people trying to put them down as a band. Yeah, and people have, you know, obviously seen it. I'm sure he's seen it. Impressive. Sure. He's heard it because I'm sure he's heard it. Thing. Right? Of course he has. But the thing is, and this is what I relate to and I'm inspired by, the guy goes, all right. You know, it's almost like getting punched in the face and he gets up and goes, oh, I'm bleeding. All right, well, how about another one? Yeah. Let's fight some more. Yeah. Boom, hits you in the face. With another hit. With another, another hit. Song. And then <laughs> he gets hit again, because he had another hit. Yeah. There's a counter hit. Yeah. There's always a counter hit when you have a hit. Yeah. You know? So there's always, always the public hits back when you, have, when you hit yeah. the public. And then he gets up again. It's like Wolverine, you know? Yeah. Just keeps getting up. And, uh, and now he comes up again right. with the best song he's ever written. I know. That to me is really, really, really inspiring. Because after after How You Remind Me, which was, you know, obviously one of the biggest rock songs ever right. that year, it just was, right. it was a blowtorch. Right. But the yeah. problem is, though, with, yeah. the, with Nickelback, that yeah. the problem they face, not the problem with them, but the problem yeah. they face, is that I'm sure that they have all these other influences they want to incorporate, but they're not allowed, that, that's, they'll never put those singles out. Right. The public has come to understand 
This is what Nickelback is. They play these mid-tempo rock things. That don't rock too hard so they can get it. And you know, these guys probably have love and affinity for other types of music that they're not able to put out. Right. They've now entered into this deal that has locked them into this thing. And I never want to do that, yeah. which is, and if there was a kind of business sense in this, which there is a little bit, not money-wise, but shaping it career-wise, yeah. John Mayer Trio is a run for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Because it's not time to have the firewalls come down. No. I mean, the, and it's know. good that you're doing that. Yeah. Those songs are great songs of your buddy as one of my daughters. They really are. Um, Thank you. And you know they are. I don't great. apologize for yeah, them, by you the way. Never, you know? because they're great. And you know, people have spoken. They love those tracks. Well, they're relics, but they're relics to everybody. Yeah. I mean, when you hear your body is a wonderland, you're going to think about 2002, yeah. where you were when it was. I think about where I was when it was on. Yeah. And I don't think there's any problem in saying I respect everything about what I've done already. Yeah. But I'm really excited about, if you get to go listen to new music, why can't I go play new music? Right, exactly. Like, like yeah. you're allowed to go, oh, wow, that was a cool record. Oh, uh, now I'm onto this. Yeah. Why can't I do that and go, that was a cool record. Oh, but now I'm onto this, but with my own music. Yeah, exactly. You know, it would be a very unfair prospect to think yeah. that I couldn't do that for myself. It's important you know? that you can. And you're doing it, which is, which is and it's totally I'm doing awesome. it, and, and, and now is the time for me to, for me to, for me, this is like, everything I've learned about pop and blues is about to come together. Cool. I knew we were going to do it. I'm really excited about it. Let's talk about some of the other extra extracurricular things that you've been doing. Like, uh, I know you've been writing for Esquire, doing a column. Yeah. Tell me about how that came about. Um, I mentioned to my publicist one night, I said, you know, it'd be really cool to, like, write a column. I could write a column every month. And she got yeah. it for me. She said uh, if they would love to do it. And it's tricky. It's a tricky column to write because I am a musician. I'm not an overly accomplished musician. So I have to make sure what voice my writing is, is taking on. Yeah. So it's, it's not a critique at all. I just have a lot of ideas about music that I want everybody to understand. Yeah. Um, and when I think something is underappreciated in any respect, an artist, an ideal, yeah. um, I kind of feel like the equalizer. Yeah. That I want to yeah. make sure people are looking at the right stuff. Right. This is cool, but check out why that's cool. and Listen to that. Um, and it's really great. I usually have one idea a month that I wish I could get on a soapbox and tell everybody. Yeah. And they're never, they're never, they're never trying to put anyone down or, 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 you know, I have to watch out that I don't get on a crow's nest, yeah. you know, and look yeah. down and go, here's who, here's who I deem worthy. Yeah. So it's been interesting in finding the tone of it, but. It's a great outlet for me. Yeah. You know. Yeah, John. What can we expect from the new album Continuum? What kind of things will will there be? I mean, with you and Steve working on that together. Um, are there? You said seven, so. You're about seventy five percent done right now. Yeah. So you yeah. think you have what about eight, eight, nine songs right now that you're definitely going with on the record? Eight songs definitely going with. Three more tunes we're going to record yeah. in November that were written with the trio. Right. Um, it's every, okay. I've started to learn the difference between music that is soulful and music that contains good ideas. There's a lot of music that contains very good ideas. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, listen to that. Yeah. Oh, this, you know, oh, good idea. Yeah. Oh, good idea. And this record is incredibly soulful. Um, every tune has a blues feel to it. And that's been tough. It's been tough to write only those songs because sometimes I do want to write other things. I have, I've, I've had to kick them to the curb and maybe put them on yeah. another record. So where my first two records were write the best songs you can write and put them on an album. Continuum is write the best songs you can write inside of this ideal, which is the resonance emotionally of soul music. You know, yeah. Ray Charles. Why do those Ray Charles chord progressions? It brings a tear mm, yeah. into my eyes mm, yeah. when I begin mm, yeah. to realize. Uh, you know, yeah. I cried so much. Oh, do 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 ba do do ba do 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 ba do 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 do. They never go away. Ever, yeah. ever, ever go away. And some of these tunes kind of have that that feel to it. I love Derek and the Dominoes. I love Cream. Mm. I love um, Do you like the Blind Faith stuff. Too? The Blind Faith stuff. I love Jimi Hendrix. I love Stevie Ray Vaughan. I love yeah. Ray Charles. I yeah. love Albert King. Yeah. And then I love Hooks. Yeah. I love Hooks. I love Here It Comes. Here It yeah. Comes. Here yeah. It Comes. And then the Hook hits. And the Hook hits. That's what makes the song great. So if you could take that roller coaster. Yeah. 
that pop thing of it goes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And you know, Coldplay does that. Here it comes, here it comes, and the truth is, yeah. I miss you. Oh, there yeah, it is. Yeah. If you can do that, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes thing, which is the pop world. Yeah. But do that with, here it comes, here it comes, da, ba, 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 ba. chord change. With the blues ba, 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 yeah. But different chords. Like, that's yeah. what Clapton's doing is yeah. on his solo stuff, he's taking blues guitar playing. I mean, Wonderful Tonight. The guitar line of that is a—it's a, it's blues. It's it in is. a blues box. Very much so. You know, yeah. and if you can take that element, you know, like Stevie Ray playing at the end of David Bowie's "Let's Dance" is some of his best Stevie Ray Vaughan's best music yeah. because for a minute you got a glimpse of him doing an Albert King thing on a pure pop thing, which I love yeah, hearing. Which is great, yeah. And there's also a moment in my in my record where there is kind of that uh, homage to the Albert King on yeah. David Bowie thing at the yeah. end, you know. I look forward to hearing that. That'll yeah, be cool. Yeah, so. But it was always great at pulling great guitars first things, whether it was Frampton or, or right. Stevie Ray or right. Mick Ronson, of course, in the right. Spiders days, all great And then uh, Reeves Gabriels. And Reeves also. See? Very creative we, guy. We could, we could do some... <laughs> God, there's nobody you don't know, is there, musically? There's very few. <laughs> I mean, you know. Love it. Yeah, it's great. Well, you I and love I love it. talking music. John, I really appreciate you coming by today. It was great no, to thanks, have you. Thanks for having and me. And we look forward to the, uh, the Trio album. I'm really excited about that. Thanks, man. People who uh, check it out, there's great stuff on there. None of this stuff is over. Yeah, and None then the new over. record, Continuum, too, which we, when do you think we'll see that? Springtime. Spring? Springtime. Right. I just have to make sure that it's, there's no dead weight. I was yeah. talking to Steven Tyler. Uh, he came to the, one of the Boston shows. Yeah. I told him about how Pump yeah. was kind of my introduction to Aerosmith, and it's their, I think it's their best record. And he said, the thing about Pump was that my mission statement was no filler. And he's right. There is no filler on that record. And that's why I remember yeah. it. And the, my mission for Continuum is no filler. Every yeah. moment of this record is either going to have a lyrical thing or a melodic thing or a guitar playing thing or a rhythmic thing, but it's never just going to go by. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Me too. It's going to be great. John, thanks so much for coming down.